Hello, and welcome to this week's midweek service from Ararat Baptist Church. We're now in the season of Epiphany, an old word which is about having a revelation, a vision of something that was once unseen. The stories we tell in Epiphany show the impact of people's encounters with God. These are sometimes dramatic, as with the visit of the Magi to the toddler King Jesus in Bethlehem, or in the psychological tension seen in tonight's story. But first, let's pray. Loving God, at the start of our meeting, at the start of Epiphany, at the start of this year, we still our hearts and present ourselves to you as we are, as you made us. God of grace, help us to meet with you and to find you as you have found us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first hymn this evening rejoices in the wideness of God's mercy. Our reading comes from 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verses 9 to 20. After they'd eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow, O Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a male child, then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, No, my lord, 
I'm a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. Then Eli answered, Go in peace. The God of Israel grant the petition you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favour in your sight. Then the woman went to her quarters, ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked him of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Loving Father, like Hannah of old, as in this story, we come before you. And that story speaks to us of a soul poured out to you in sorrow and in the crisis of her mind but also in authenticity. And so we would come before you this evening, or whenever we listen to this podcast, pouring out our souls before you. You made us, you formed us, you shaped us, you are the ground of our being. And so as your children, we come before you. We want to thank you for our lives and all that's good in our lives. Thank you for the blessings that we enjoy every moment of every day, for the people whom we love and who love us. But we also come before you realizing that uh, we so often fall short of the mark. We're not the people that we'd like to be. We're not the people that we often present ourselves to be before other people. We know all too well the attitudes of anger, of jealousy, of rage that can fill our minds and hearts. Lord, we're sorry. We don't want to be like this. And so in the genuineness of who we are now, we ask your forgiveness. And we ask you to pour the oil of your grace upon the rawness of our natures, that we might know your healing, that we might know soundness of mind and body, and that we, uh, like Hannah, might return worshipping and praising you. But we're also mindful of our world this evening, your world. And so we remember this evening uh, the climate crisis that's affecting this planet, remembering that the last seven years have been the hottest on record. We think of those areas in the world that are knowing and suffering great tension at the moment. We think of the situation in Kazakhstan. We think of the tension between Russia and Ukraine, and therefore with the rest of the world in many ways. We think of the situation between China and Hong Kong. We think of the plight of the poor and the needy in Afghanistan, facing as they are a very harsh and desperate winter with no food. And we ask, Lord, that you would move afresh in that land. And we pray, Lord, for the situation in North Korea as they have launched another ballistic missile provocatively. And so as tensions ramp up again between North Korea and her neighbours, Lord, we ask that the dove of peace, the Holy Spirit, might go and brood not simply there, but over the whole world, Lord, that the, where there is temptation and trial and warfare um, and rumour of war and the rumour of wars, Lord, we ask, Holy Spirit, would you do your work and bring peace and justice and hope 
where there is none. We ask all these things through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Some people have surprising encounters with God. I think of those who have apparently died in road traffic accidents or at sea or in the operating theatre and in their out-of-body state have a dramatic encounter with Jesus only to return to their bodies with a powerful tale to tell. I think of those who in the pursuit of a destructive, addictive, sometimes violent lifestyle discover the grace of God and are transformed to live a new life. I think of C.S. Lewis, the famous academic and author of the Narnia stories and others, who described his conversion on board an Oxford omnibus after months of intellectual wrestling with the God of the Bible. He called himself the most reluctant convert in Christendom. And then I think of Hannah in the story that we read earlier. This young woman's greatest desire is to have a child of her own. The story, an ancient one, is set in a place called Shiloh, where the Ark of the Covenant is kept. This is way before the establishment of Jerusalem and its fine temple. Hannah is present with her husband Elkanah and his other wife Penina. Polygamy was widely practiced at this time. Penina had children, Hannah had none, and she was in the depths of despair. Late one evening, Hannah takes herself to the shrine where sacrifices are made before the ark. She believes herself to be alone, but in the shadows there is a witness, the old prophet. Hannah has reached the edge of sanity. She is deeply distressed and is weeping. This is her prayer. Prayer not as eloquent words or a song of praise, but as the shattering of a heart that is breaking before God. It seems to me that Hannah's prayer is the most authentic form of prayer there is. It's unvarnished. It's unedited. It's the cascade of emotion, dark emotions, before the face of God. This story reminds me of moments in my own life. I think of the time when I was a student pastor of a church in Wiltshire where we lived in the manse next to the church. I would take myself into the quiet chapel to pray and that prayer was often one of lament and great uncertainty. Was I called to this? Was it genuine? Was God even listening? I look back at it as a kind of white knuckle ride of prayer. It was prayer that was without censorship. It was a prayer as a kind of howling before God. I can't say that he, I heard his voice uh, or was even aware necessarily of his presence, but I remember the experience. Or I remember an occasion in my last church after a meeting when everyone had left where I poured out my soul noisily and without restraint. I remember sitting on the platform on the stage uh, with nobody present and just shouting at God, a mixture of praise and worship, but, but real desperation. I can't even remember why now on my part, but this I remember as I recall this story of Hannah. And this is no performance on Hannah's part. As far as she's concerned, she is alone with God and she presents herself as she is and not as she thinks she ought to behave. I wonder how many of us have prayed like Hannah here. I wonder, as we think of Hannah, what memories come to mind of situation, maybe times in our life 
where we've been at the edge of ourselves and we find ourselves, we have found ourselves somehow looking for God in that that in-between place where we no longer can cope, maybe. Maybe all our powers have run dry and we are reaching out to the God who is there. But of course there is a witness and the old prophet Eli observes something. He sees Hannah's lips moving but no voice. Hannah's desperate plea is to have a child and she is heard by none other than the Lord. It's an inner prayer. It's an internal dialogue. Eli didn't hear the words. He sees the lips moving, but no voice. It's a very powerful illustration of a certain kind of prayer, that, isn't it? The lips moving, but no voice heard. Many centuries later, Paul the Apostle will describe prayer as wordless groaning. We don't know what to pray. We don't know what to say. We've reached the edge of ourselves, and so we are reliant on the Holy Spirit to help us. Groans beyond words. And again, I wonder how many of us can remember such occasions in our own life when the words have dried up, when the theology won't satisfy any more. And in the rawness of the moment, we reach out to the rawness of God. Eli, of course, completely misreads the situation. It's not uncommon for us religious people. We often get the wrong end of the stick. Instead of seeing a vulnerable woman in raw communion with God, he sees a drunk and he tells her to clear off. I think of a story uh, in the college where I trained, Bristol Baptist College, and a former principal uh, by the name of Arthur Deakin, I think his name was, or was it Arthur Dacre? I can't remember. But uh, he'd published a number of books, but uh, as was and is the role of college principals, he would be often preaching in uh, various churches in the West Country. And one Sunday, he went to lead a gathering and uh, praying with the deacons beforehand, one of the deacons came in saying, oh no, the, the drunkard has come to church today. And they all knew to whom he was referring. And Dr. Dakin said, no, he's not a drunkard. He is a man who has drink issues. And this man who has drink issues is in God's house today. And this man has a family and he has people who love him and whom he loves. He's more than a drunkard. He's one of God's children. It's an example of someone who's so beyond the appearances and to the heart of the situation. Well, that's what Eli doesn't really see here. He just writes her off as a drunkard. But Hannah finds her voice and she corrects Eli and tells her story. I wonder how often I've done that. You know, some people find it very easy to talk about themselves. Maybe they're confident, uh, maybe they're quite used to defending themselves, but other of us, others of us aren't and tend to keep quiet, often to our own detriment, often uh, being misunderstood. But Hannah is given the courage to set the record straight. I wonder if she found the courage in that moment, because up to this point of the story, um, it's really about how things have been done to Hannah or the misfortunes of Hannah or how Hannah's, Hannah's been overlooked she feels so often but now she has a voice this voiceless prayer gives birth to a voice this woman with no voice in prayer suddenly finds a voice and she tells Eli very courteously but very directly I'm not drunk I am genuine I'm pouring my soul out to God I want a child I've made certain promises uh, and of course Eli then says, well, go on your way then. Go on your way and may God give to you what you're looking for. There's no real recognition here uh, that Eli has really re listened particularly to her. Uh, if this was a case study in counselling, I don't think Eli would do so well. He's misread the situation uh, and he kind of gives her a rather bland benediction and will go on your way 
and may God give you something. But the transaction's already happened. Something very powerful has happened. Uh, we're not even aware. Maybe Hannah wasn't even aware that this had happened, but her prayer has been heard, and her prayer will be answered, as we will discover with the birth of Samuel in the next couple of chapters. I wonder what kind of epiphany we would describe for Hannah. It seems to me that Hannah's experience is an epiphany through tears and sorrow. It's the wrestling with God until she feels she has been heard. Maybe this story teaches us that when we've reached the edge of our own powers and certainties, and when we pour our souls out before God, then maybe that's the place where we cross over into a new dimension of God's presence. This is the faith that we can see in Gethsemane, in Calvary, and in the innumerable extremes faced by God's people throughout history. These are the deep waters of faith and trust. This is where our own powers, our own control has run out, and we simply have to trust that the God who is there is the God who is with us, and the God who will hold us, and the God who will see us through. May this be our experience in this year of 2022. Amen. Our next hymn invites us, invites our souls to praise the King of Heaven. And so may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon us and give us his peace. Amen.